business. Whenever McQueen and I had talked about it, the idea was to do one man, one time, one race, and the race would be Le Mans. Le Mans. The essence is speed. I don't think you could make another film like Le Mans, which was shot all for real. I don't know if you would want to because of the, it's much safer now. I mean, you know, people could get hurt that way. The objective is winning, and the danger is dying. Steve was so taken with motor racing. He'd been involved in it uh, for many years. He wanted to badly do the ultimate picture about motor racing. Steve McQueen, you know, was highly respected by the other drivers. He loved being amongst us, loved, you know, breathing the atmosphere. At 200 miles an hour, a pressure of winning and losing is tough enough. Explaining it to someone else makes it even tougher. The melodrama that, that, uh, that went on behind the cameras of Le Mans is extraordinary. When you're racing, it, it's life. Anything that happened before or after, it's just waiting. Le Mans, the men, the machines, the motion picture. Steve McQueen stars in it. No one else could. You've just seen the trailer to the legendary 1971 film Le Mans. So buckle up and take a ride with us. I'm Chad McQueen, and I'll be your host. This story begins with a race of a different sort. In 1965, my father's company, Solar Productions, bought the rights to a book called The Cruel Sport. But as it turns out, director John Frankenheimer had the same rights. As they say in the movie business, the first to the screen wins. Well, with months and millions of dollars spent on what Solar called the Day of the Champion, Warner Brothers pulled the plug. And that made way for Frankenheimer's classic film, Grand Prix. One thing that I can tell you is that my father never gave up. And in 1969, Solar Productions began rolling on a classic film called Le Mans. Coming up, you're going to see some fantastic home movies, stills, and actual scenes from the movie. And we're going to hear from the people that worked on the movie. So please, stay tuned. Day of the Champion fell through, my dad's production company, Solar Productions, still wanted to make the best racing film ever. And after the success of Bullet, my dad could pretty much write his own ticket in Hollywood. Here's close family friend Bob Rillier to explain. I was working for John Sturgis, and he got together with McQueen. They had made three or four pictures together, The Magnificent Seven, The Great Escape, Le Mans was born when Steve McQueen and I went to Warner Brothers to make six pictures. We shot the picture twice. We shot it in 69 to find out how to shoot it in 70. 
1969 was the first time that we took cameras, multiple, I believe it was around 20, and staked it out as if we were shooting, but without actors or makeup or anything else. Obviously, we studied it and used it to explain to the cameraman, to explain to everybody how the race worked and what it looked like and see how the straight is interesting, see how certain curves don't work. In the days of Le Mans, there weren't any computer-generated uh, toys to play with. What you did, you got. Those cars were running at speed. The passing was done at speed. In 1970, we went over proper ahead of time with a rather simple plan that you do for any kind of event motion picture. That is to say, go in, get ready, shoot the practice, shoot the race itself and then shut down and wait for all those people to go home and then go back and make the move. We had 20 crews that shot a lot of the practice, took in shifts, but once on the predetermined positions when they were established and the race started, those crews stayed on their camera the whole 24 hours. In those days, it wasn't like now with car cams or anything else. It was uh, very difficult to get the racing authorities to allow cameras on because several years before, somebody had allowed the camera on at a race, not Le Mans, and the camera had come off. The grips came up with a way to have a plate on the front of the car and shooting back in the car behind the head that when they came in for a pit stop, all they had to do was undo the butterfly screws and put on a new plate that had the cameras on, threaded, loaded, ready to go. The classic story about the 24 hours of the race, which went quite well, was that we had entered a 908 uh, Porsche uh, that had to qualify on the race and, and carried three cameras. In that particular race at midnight, one heck of a storm came out and most of the big cars went out of the race. And about three o'clock in the morning, the production manager comes running up to me and says, the 908 is running eighth, and if we don't keep coming in to change film, we could win this thing. And I said, I, I can't wait to go back to Cinema Center Films and say, look, we didn't get all the film, but we got this trophy. I said, I don't think that's gonna work. Let's keep going with the film. Galen Schultz was the key grip on the picture who was in charge primarily of camera mounts. At one time or another, uh, during the racing sequences, he would put five cameras on one 917 or 512 and have it going uh, on, on the Mulsanne, going wherever, without any problems whatsoever aer aerodynamically. It was so innovative what the guys did with those cameras. At the time, we were going, well, I wish we could make it more realistic. Nowadays, we could do it with cameras. We could do so much with cameras, you didn't have to have the danger angle in it so much. They really made it as realistic as it had been in the race. They brought this gantry, which is a big flat plate on an arm, to the side of the track with a cameraman sitting up there, and they'd bring it down, and uh, you know, we'd literally come around the corner, and as you came up, you thought, at, you know, at 180, I'm not going to get under that. And then he went underneath and it, everything was fine. One of the more interesting mounts shots that we had was a side mount on Steve's 917 on the first driver chain, which was shooting through the window at Steve. And I talked to Galen and I said, can we put a mount on? And when the car comes to a stop, we have two operators. And you put it on a solenoid and disconnect it so they can take it and follow Steve around and see the rest of the, uh, the traffic go behind it. And he thought about it, he said, yeah, sure. So we did it, and it was perfect. It's just not, it's not in the picture. But it was nasty for a few seconds because I was about to take the Ferrari out, as well as a lot of cameras. Now with the filming of the 24-hour race completed, the real challenge of making the movie began. When you shoot on race day, you shoot from the pits out, showing the big grandstand. 
when you're staging the picture afterward, you shoot from the grandstand towards the pits where you can put in enough people to make it look good. It looks like you're really there. We had a lot of, a lot of foreground action and a lot of, of people moving in and out, matching with all the photographers. It looked rather good, I must say. We brought uh, a Dutch driver by the name of Rob Slotemacher, who I was told was a expert in spinning the car. I said, oh, sure. I said, well, I've driven with him, worked with the best Hollywood drivers in the world. And I said, okay, well, let's see what he can do. So I told him, come here, you, you just missed the fence, you missed this car, spin three times and head that way. And that's exactly what he did. It's exactly what he did. So we used him any number of times, and he was just extraordinary. The special effects men on the show were Sass Betting and Paul Pollard, who were two of the best from Hollywood that we had. They had rehearsed the first radio control stunt, which was the Ferrari crash at Indianapolis. We shot it on a Saturday because we needed about five or eight hundred people at Indianapolis Corner to fill it up. And it worked. With the exception that it took off on the, the Indianapolis Corner and was not supposed to hit the Martini Ross itself. The other remote control sequence was the McQueen shunt, which by that time they had had considerable practice on other things, and that happened on take one. When Steve looks off and is distracted by the blowing up to his right of the, of the uh, Ferrari, and that he runs into the slower 917, it hit every mark on every camera. We had 12 cameras or 14 cameras, and hit every single mark. It was perfect. And we saw it, and we were just fascinated by it. You know, we didn't have a bad shot. When the Queen comes up on the eighth car, I said it would be interesting if we could have him come up, scare the hell out of him by being that close to him, and then swing around and pass him. I said, what if we put a camera at the back of the, the car and have the driver hit a solenoid and have it cause the camera to pan with it as he swings out and, and passes the car. And they rehearsed it and they did it. Take two. What they didn't allow for was the actual, the weight of the camera swinging around at 160 or 170 miles an hour. And as the car sort of got like, as the camera came around and clunked into position, it made the car do that towards the Ferrari. At the same time, it got light at the front because of that sort of movement. And it was a bit unstable. So we had to put a lot of weight on the front of the car, but it was nasty for a few seconds because I was about to take the Ferrari out as well as a lot of cameras. Steve was writing the great American novel and suddenly, he just couldn't get it on paper. My father's vision for the film was to make it as documentary-like as possible. Uh, he wanted the respect of the racers. I don't think he cared much about what people in Hollywood thought. The people that were financing the movie saw it a different way. They felt that there was no script. So it wasn't exactly love and kisses on the set. The breakdown between Cinema Center and Solar is that we had gone into a rather lengthy debate over the basis of the film. It's common in Hollywood to start without a script. It's not the right way, it's not the economic way, but it's common. And anybody who says it's not hasn't been there. There was never a script for the movie the whole way through. And I don't know how we ever made it work. We had script writers coming in every week with a new script. And we just carried on following the race as if it were a film. Steve was writing the great American novel. And suddenly, he just couldn't get it on paper. And so I jumped on an airplane and went to, to Le Mans. It was obvious. It, was like, it wasn't like, you, you, you know, this wasn't rocket science. When, when you don't have a script, when all the actors are unhappy because they don't have any lines. We didn't have a leading lady. There was no budget on the film because there was no script and no schedule. I mean, what can I tell you? Things weren't good. 
one day I went into my office and I believe I threw something. I said, that's enough of this, we're losing control. Sitting on the couch was Bob Rosen from Cinema Center. We went back to his office and called the studio and said, we got real problems now. They're falling out among themselves. To which the next 747 that came into Paris had all of Cinema Center's executives. We had a meeting the next day at the castle Steve was staying in. We discussed what Cinema Center was doing. And when the studio took it over, McQueen felt that that had put a knife in the heart of the company. I don't think they talked after that at all. And, and uh, I, you know, Steve felt betrayed and what have you. The smart person involved was the late John Sturgis, because I was on the phone in this early part of this two-week period, and he stuck his head in the door, and I said, come on in, I'll be off in a couple of minutes, and John said, no, that's all right, I'm just going to go on home, I'll talk to you later. I thought he meant back to the hotel. He didn't. He meant back to Los Angeles, and he went to the airport and got on the plane and went home. Back in Hollywood, television director Lee Katzen was preparing a separate project for Cinema Center. The company called him to talk about finishing filming Le Mans. The next day, he was on his way to France. I arrived in Paris and was met uh, by uh, Rosen, and they told me the stories and the problems they had with the physical aspects of it and the money aspects of it, and the fact that um, we would be doing a lot of this tap dancing because we had no script. The first thing I said to Steve when he came in, I said, I know nothing about this kind of racing. Tell me what to do and we'll see how we can make it work. Best for the picture. The problems of individuals' egos were there. There were times when we did not know what we were going to shoot the next day. It wasn't, it wasn't a lot of fun that way. We had uh, altercations and my feeling was that I just wanted to try to make a very good picture with a story that people would like to watch. One morning at Solar Village, Steve came over to see me. He said, Lee, I see what you're trying to do, and I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to be against you. I want to work with you. I couldn't I said, that's wonderful. That's all I ever wanted to do. From that time on, it was wonderful. We had a wonderful interchange, and everything worked out really quite well. We would sit in the editing room saying, well, maybe we could make a sequence out of this. Point in fact, in post-production, we were sitting trying to make the movie. I've never had experience like that before, and I've never had one since. Where we were literally making up sequences with existing footage and trying to get to the end. We had a beginning, middle, not really an end, when we finished shooting. We had a million feet of film, of racing footage, and we would sit in the editing room saying, well, maybe we could make a sequence out of this. We wanted to be as close to Steve's vision as we could possibly make it, and make it as authentic as possible. All of the sounds were specific. Every single car, every single thing is a 917 or a Ferrari or a Lola or whatever. It's the real sound in the right gear. A few days prior to the premiere, we showed the film to Steve McQueen. I didn't think Steve would like it. I mean, because he, he hadn't had a hand in the, in the post-production, I really didn't think he would like it. And when the lights came up, he turned around and he gave me a big hug. And he said, now you see what was in my head, you know? And uh, he was very complimentary and, and liked what we had done. He was very happy. The first time we saw the whole picture put together was in Indianapolis, and there was a special charity premiere. And that was the first time Lee and I had actually seen the entire movie put together. 
The film made $22 million, which was the same as Dirty Harry made. It did, well, uh, we thought it should have done more than that because there was no bigger star at that time than Steve McQueen. This movie started when somebody said, gentlemen, start your engines at Le Mans. And it ended because we had committed to this premiere the night before the Indianapolis race on Memorial Day, and, and that was the end of it. So there were two, the only two givens of that movie was the start and the end. The middle was chaos. <laughs> I think to, to have been part of the Le Mans 24 hour race film, it stood the test of time. It's something that I never thought would ever stand up 30 years later and be probably better. It's like a vintage wine. It's better today than it was then. It's remarkable. People, a lot of people have taken a crack at this since then, you know, the days of thunder and driven and what have you. And now with the, the toys that one has, uh, there's so much more one can do. And yet, I must say from the racing standpoint, I think we captured what Steve wanted. Thank you, Michael. After months and months of shooting, and almost a million feet of film, my father's vision was finally realized. But the things that stick out in my mind is the mini Le Mans race, which is a couple hours long. They do a track with hay bales. Uh, I was following the kid that was the fastest one. He was in a white GT40. And we came around a corner and I just kind of bumped him and he went off and hit, hit the hay bales. And I've got a picture of me shaking his hand at the end of the race. I got first place and I, to this day, I still have that, that trophy. Yeah, it was two hours, and I remember my dad, uh, uh, I remember my dad, he was really happy that, uh, that I won. You know, I was constantly pestering my dad, hey, you know, can I get a ride? You know, can you just give me a little ride? One day they were shooting on the Mulsanne Strait, uh, and I was standing at the Mulsanne corner, and they're coming up over the kink, and the, they're braking, and the cars are getting unsettled, and they'd done a couple runs, and my dad comes down and turns around at the corner heading back towards camera and he pops open the door and waves me over, you know? So I ran over and I <clears throat> jumped on his lap and uh, steering wheels here, shifters here, and I kind of, you know, wedged my foot, you know, like here, put my hands on the wheel, closed the door, he chunked it down at first and, you know, went through the first three gears. I think he was very careful because I didn't have a helmet. He was not going that fast, but he, I think he wanted me to feel the acceleration. But I, you know, the G-forces, I you know, felt like my face was doing that. And recently, I got to drive the same exact 917 uh, that my dad put me in in, uh, in 1970. Going down the track and looking in the rearview mirror and seeing a 512 behind you, you know, it was, uh, it was a great day. I got to do something that was really neat is I've got a, a son, uh, six years old, and I got to put him on my lap. See how we're laying down like this? It was uh, kind of like reliving the movie, you know?